Our next speaker will be Jeff Hunt talking about the Texas Doughboys Go to War, the 36th Infantry Division in the Great War. I do have to mention our sponsor for this session, the Texas Society of Professional Surveyors who are out there. We work very closely with them at the GLO and thank you for their support for many years now. Uh, Jeff Hunt is the director of the Texas Military Forces Museum at Camp Mabry in Austin and an adjunct professor of history at Austin Community College. Uh, the museum will be where we're having our reception tonight. There are still spaces if you would like to change your mind and would like to go now. And I'll say this several times today, do not go down by Mopac today. Go down Burnett or Burnett Street, however you call, however you say it, and then cross over the 35th Street Bridge and enter uh, the base that way. Do not get on Mopac. Uh, Jeff was previously the curator of collections at the Admiral Nimitz Museum, National Museum of the, of the Pacific. Uh, he has written numerous articles, as well as the book, The Last Battle of the Civil War, Palmetto Ranch. And it has an upcoming book, After Gettysburg, Before Grant, due out this spring. He holds a bachelor's in government and a master's in history from UT Austin. Um, he will discuss the 36th Infantry Division, that's the Texas Division, in the Great War. Please help me in welcoming Jeff. Uh, hello, and I will try and stay on time because I know that I'm the last thing between you and lunch. Uh, so, <laughs> um, we've uh, been looking this morning at the First World War in sort of a macro sense, and now we're going to sort of bring it down literally uh, into the trenches by talking about the role of the 36th Infantry Division of the Texas and Oklahoma National Guard uh, in the Great War. And uh, remember that at the time it wasn't called World War I. Uh, think about how depressing that would have been, because uh, it certainly implies, well, if there's a one, there must be a two, and maybe a three, and a four, and so on. They called it the Great War, uh, not because it was a lovely little war, uh, but because it was the largest war that humanity had ever fought. And the United States tried for a very long time to stay out of that conflict, but uh, as we've seen, it was eventually uh, sucked into it. And World War I, or the Great War, if we want to stay within the time frame, uh, it was a watershed event in human history in many, many ways. It was uh, technologically a watershed in the way that we fought wars. Uh, the, the first use of the airplane is an implement of war, the diesel submarine, the flamethrower, poison gas, uh, the widespread use of machine guns uh, for the first time in military history in a large conflict. Uh, it was also a watershed uh, in terms of overall human history because virtually everything that has happened in the world since 1914 draws a straight line back to that war and the peace that was made in the aftermath of that war. We still live in its shadow in a very real and meaningful way. And it was also a watershed in the way that the United States uh, military went to war. Uh, from the very earliest days of our country, and before we had even declared our independence, uh, we relied uh, on the militia to a certain extent, but that's always been a misnomer because for prolonged conflict, the militia was unable to sustain military operation. Uh, militia was an emergency reaction force uh, that was designed to be mobilized uh, in a local area to serve for a relatively brief period of time. But if you were going to launch uh, expeditionary uh, uh, operations, if you were going to have a prolonged conflict, you relied on volunteer units. Uh, and so these were units that were specially called uh, uh, into being uh, to fight the American Revolution, the War of 1812, the War with Mexico, and the War between the states. Uh, the regular army uh, would be a separate entity. You would have this vast volunteer army, uh, and that volunteer army was always called up uh, once the conflict had started. So you had all of the woes of a mass and hurried mobilization and you know, having to train you know, hundreds of thousands of men in the case of the war between the states to, you know, to be soldiers and to train the officers and these sorts of things. Uh, and that system had worked more or less satisfactorily uh, throughout American history in large part because the people that we fought had to do it the same way. Uh, 
Uh, in the aftermath of the war between the states, though, this begins to change. As technology changes, the, the speed of warfare changes, the way that you mobilize has to change. And it produced in the second half of the 19th century a huge argument in the United States because uh, the regular army wasn't getting much in the way of resources, and it didn't want any of its resources to be diverted into all of these state militias, which it believed from its professional vantage point correctly, uh, were all but worthless. What good is the militia uh, if you can't really use the militia when you go to war? You have to then you know, get all these volunteers. Uh, and so the regular army wanted to get rid of the state forces, uh, believed that they were little better than strike breakers uh, and riot stoppers. Uh, at any rate, and, uh, and not professional forces. And there was uh, something to that, that they weren't professional, and that something was kind of uh, the work of the regular army and Congress itself, uh, because they didn't fund the state militias. The states were on their own uh, for funding the militias, and by uh, the old uh, militia acts, uh, a state got resources from the federal government in proportion to its population. So some states like New York uh, got more in the way of weapons and armament and stuff like that, and other states uh, did not. Uh, you also have the complication that after 1865, no state that had seceded from the Union was allowed to have a militia until 1870. Uh, and uh, that meant that from 1865 to 1870, Texas had no uh, militia force whatsoever. That restriction was lifted in 1870, uh, and we created something called the Volunteer Guard. Uh, but the Volunteer Guard in Texas was like many such organizations in a lot of states. Uh, it received no state funding. It received no federal funding. The only federal resources were hand-me-down weapons and accoutrements left over from the Civil War, uh, and that meant that the Volunteer Guard had to fund its own activities. So it had to uh, buy its own uniforms, it had to pay for its own training, it had to pay uh, to get to the, the two-week summer encampment it was supposed to attend every year, had to pay the rent and the utilities on its own armories, and if the government's not giving you the money to do that, you have to do it. And so, the, a lot of these volunteer guard units uh, spent most of their time fundraising. Uh, and so they held balls and parades and drill competitions and reenactment battles and these sorts of things that they could sell tickets to so that they could keep themselves in operation. Of course, that meant that you really didn't have much time uh, for serious military training. And so it you know, sort of is a, a little vicious cycle there. Uh, and when the Spanish-American War rolled around, uh, it sort of proved that. The, the Volunteer Guard was not called up for the Spanish-American War. Uh, there was a call for volunteers. Uh, and a lot of volunteer guardsmen did volunteer, but entire companies of Volunteer Guard refused to mobilize for the Spanish-American War. And so the Army pointed at that and said, see, these volunteer state organizations are useless. That argument didn't carry the day because these volunteer state organizations were politically very, very powerful. Uh, and they were hooked into a long tradition of militia volunteer service in the United States. And the argument of the advocates of maintaining the volunteers said that, you know, this is the way that we've always done it. Uh, the militias can be the ready reserve, uh, literally almost the Minuteman can spring into being at the moment that we get into a big war, uh, but if you want them to be really valuable, you've got to start spending money on them. You've got to start giving them resources, and you've got to stop treating them like redheaded stepchildren. Uh, and so this argument went on through the 1870s, the 1880s, and the 1890s, uh, all the way up until uh, the uh, dawn of the uh, 20th century. And in 1903, there was sort of the, 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 uh, the final compromise between the advocates of the volunteer forces and the advocates of the regular army uh, with the passage of the Militia Act. And that was all uh, the brainchild of Senator Charles W.F. Dick, who himself was a militiaman. He was uh, head of the militia committee uh, in the United States Senate. Uh, and he shoves through the Congress something called the Militia Act of 1903, which formally created what today we know as the National Guard. 
Uh, previous to this, every state kind of had its own name. Texas had a volunteer guard and others had national guards and others had state guard. Now they get one big name. They are the National Guard and they will get some federal funding. Uh, and in exchange for that, they will have to live under U.S. Army regulations. No more doing this the way that your state wants to do it and the good old boy club is supposed to go away. We're going to have officer training and joint exercises. And we're going to give the President of the United States the authority to mobilize the Guard for up to nine months at a time with the proviso the Guard could not be sent beyond the continental confines of the United States. Uh, as the world moves deeper into the 20th century and you have all sorts of nasty things happening around the globe, uh, such as the Russo-Japanese War and, and uh, st instability everywhere, uh, this Militia Act is amended in 1908 uh, so that when the United States has a general mobilization, the Guard has to be mobilized first. So the regular army's there, then you must call up the entire Guard and then you can ask for volunteers. That, that became the way uh, that it was going to be done. And the uh, restriction against the Guard being able to serve overseas was lifted, as was the nine-month uh, limit on how long the Guard could be called into service. Now the president would decide how long that term of service would be. So this is a fundamental change in the military structure uh, of the United uh, States. Uh, and it got its first test. Uh, due to our entanglement with Mexico, which my previous uh, colleagues up here have already talked about. But when the United States gets sucked into that problem, uh, Texas is one of the uh, uh, National Guard forces that is initially mobilized. And uh, a lot of what the regular army had predicted it would find when it dealt with these National Guard units uh, turned out to be true. Uh, there were a lot of men on the rolls who were older and in poor health and not really, you know, physically capable of mobilization. Uh, there was a shortage of almost everything. Uh, and this was, uh, this was uh, something uh, that the papers up north mocked because Texas had, well, since Texas came into existence, said uh, Mexico is our problem. And we can deal with Mexico. And in fact, in 1916, as this whole business with Pancho Villa really got going, uh, someone uh, sent a letter to the Adjutant General of Texas and, and asked, uh, was, was Texas ready for this? And the Adjutant General sent back a telegram. It was very short and it said, Texas can whip Mexico by itself. <laughs> Rest of country not needed. Uh, and, and, that turned out to be very untrue. The Texas Guard really was not ready, and it was given uh, virtually no time to mobilize. Uh, it did, by the end of the troubles on the border, uh, put a brigade uh, in the field, almost 4,000 men. Uh, and they did credible service in very difficult circumstances. Some of the other guard units from uh, other states uh, who had more time to prepare and gear themselves up, you know, came into Texas and they did a lot better. Uh, by and large, though, the mobilization for border duty was a haphazard and confusing business that tended to highlight the, the problems in the guard more than the benefits of the guard. But that was not in and of itself a bad thing uh, because it meant that before we have the mobilization to go into the Great War, uh, we've exposed some of these problems and, and we've learned some lessons. In other words, this was a very useful, if unsatisfying, uh, uh, preseason game. Uh, that we had just, uh, you know, taken part in. Uh, and uh, it did indicate that the Guard at least could stand itself up uh, fairly rapidly uh, if that was needed. And, of course, it turned out to be needed very quickly because hardly had the Guardsmen come home uh, from the mobilization on the border. And, and, by the way, no Guard troops go into Mexico. The putative expedition is almost entirely a regular army uh, event. So the guard was called up to protect the border, not to chase Pancho Villa. So it's really kind of inaccurate to say that the guard's part of the punitive expedition. Uh, it, it's really not. Uh, but it had at least to some extent proven its utility uh, in this crisis. And then comes the crisis uh, of the Great War. And the United States enters in April of 1917. Uh, by the time that the war is over, uh, 
4 million 700 and something thousand Americans will be in uniform. About half of those will actually get to France uh, while the fighting is still going on. Uh, just under 200,000 Texans are going to serve. That's the fifth highest total uh, of any state. So uh, New York and Pennsylvania, uh, Illinois and Ohio are ahead of us, but they're, uh, except for New York, they're not that far ahead of us. So, uh, and this is a trend that, of course, will continue in World War II. In World War II, Texas will represent 5% of the population of the United States, and it will contribute 7% uh, of the personnel in its armed forces. So uh, you, you have a war, Texans will show up. We're, we're happy to be there. Uh, one of the things, of course, that a lot of people don't understand is that just because you were a Texan and you were in World War I, that doesn't mean you were in the 36th Infantry Division. The overwhelming majority of Texans are not in the Texas National Guard. Uh, they are not in the Guard when the Guard is called up. And even if they're drafted, they're enlisted, they don't go into uh, a Texas Guard unit. They are sent into every other organization and formation that the U.S. Army has. So uh, although these units have something of a state identity in the beginning, uh, they've all very quickly become all American units. Uh, that did not always work out very well in the beginning. Uh, you take a bunch of Yankee draftees and you toss them into a Texas National Guard division. Uh, the Civil War wasn't that long ago. Uh, you know, there were still living Civil War veterans around, uh, and, uh, and there were occasional fisticuffs uh, between northern and southern boys who got mixed into the same uh, unit. Uh, but I, as is always the case, uh, the common Americanism, you know, wins through after there have been enough fistfights anyway uh, for everybody to understand the other fellow's not going to get pushed around. Uh, so the United States is in the war. And the National Guard is called up. Now, the way that we had organized our military forces before was always by state. Uh, and so you had the 1st Texas Infantry, and you had the 1st Illinois Infantry, and you had the 3rd New York, and the 4th Virginia. Uh, and whereas that was an accurate way to label the units, as they came into existence, uh, and it certainly fostered esprit de corps and state pride. It was a really confusing thing militarily, uh, you know, to have how many first regiments of something, something in the, uh, you know, in your division or in your corps or in your army. Uh, and it was certainly not a way that was very conducive to modern warfare, which had become so industrialized and was increasingly mechanized. So one of the things, remember, that the Army says is if we're going to let the National Guard exist and we're going to draw it into our bosom, you're going to do things our way from here on out. And one of the things the Army said is this business, 1st Texas, 2nd Texas, 3rd, that's gone. Now we're going to impose logic and order. So we're going to start with regiment number one, and we're going to work our way up to however many regiments of infantry we have, and they're going to be numbered sequentially. So there's only going to be one first regiment in the whole army, and there's only going to be one third regiment in the whole army. And when an order is issued or a map is read, you don't have to look at that three and try and figure out, okay, is that the third New York or the third Oklahoma? We Now we know it's just the third regiment of U.S. infantry. The Regimental structure was going to be consumed, of course, in brigade and division structures. And in military parlance, a division uh, in World War I and World War II is, in essence, a mini army. It has its own supply services, communication services, uh, medical services. It is, in essence, a self-contained all-arms unit with all the support elements necessary to keep those combat forces in operation for a sustained period of time that can be sent anywhere and can fight, in essence, on its own uh, for an extended period of time. And in World War I, you had what was called the Square Division, uh, which meant uh, that you would have four infantry regiments in that uh, division. Uh, and as the Army stood up the National Guard, it combined the Texas and Oklahoma National Guard together uh, into a single division, which got the number 36. Uh, it was officially mobilized in July uh, 
1917. That's when the order went out. That's when the guard units were told, you know, mobilize, go to your armories, that kind of stuff. Uh, but it wouldn't be until August 5th of 1917 uh, that enough troops were on hand to, you know, stand out on the parade ground and read the order. Here we are, uh, the 36th Infantry Division uh, officially uh, exists. Uh, the organization, and this is, this is not all of it, these, these are just the big pieces of it. So you had two infantry brigades of two infantry regiments each uh, with an attached machine gun battalion, uh, the 141st, the 142nd infantry uh, in the 71st brigade, the 143rd and the 144th in the 72nd brigade. Then you would have an artillery brigade, uh, which would have three regiments of field artillery uh, and a trench mortar battalion. Uh, then you would have engineers, ammunition trains, sanitary train, medical detachments, these sorts of things. Uh, what you see here uh, shows you what the old state organizations were that fed into and became these modern uh, organizations, which we still have uh, most of them today. So the 1st, 2nd, and 7th Texas Infantry and the 1st Oklahoma Infantry convert to become the 141st and the 142nd and the 132nd. It's not clean. Uh, if you try and uh, follow the family tree here, uh, you get a fifth of bourbon uh, because you'll need it. Uh, I like to say that, you know, regular army lineage is, you know, sort of traditional family tree with marriages and births and stuff. A National Guard uh, army lineage is uh, a family tree, nothing but incest and uh, divorce. It just kind of, a, you can't make any sense of it uh, at all. Uh, uh, so a World War I division at full strength was a massive thing. Uh, 27,000 men. Uh, 6,600 horses and mules, and, and although trucks and motorcycles and, and all this kind of stuff are showing up, this is still largely a horse-based war. Uh, the motor vehicles were very primitive, and they're, they were better than horses and mules for speed, but not necessarily always for durability. Uh, they tended to break down. Uh, and it was also a very heavily armed uh, outfit. So 224 machine guns, 74 artillery pieces, 17,000 plus rifles, uh, 1,900 trench knives. Uh, it, it, and, and this is just the big stuff. Now imagine uniforms, hats, shoes, long underwear, belt buckles, shaving kits, you know, cots, blankets, uh, packs, helmets, and these sorts of things. So it is a massive logistical undertaking. Uh, and these big divisions uh, had advantages and disadvantages, and one of the disadvantages of them was that they were very cumbersome things to move around a battlefield. They took up a lot of road to get from place to place. Uh, they, they took a lot, a lot of area uh, to assemble and to bivouac, and of course it took a massive logistical effort to keep them supplied with food, medicine, ammunition, and all the other necessities. Uh, so they were sort of clumsy, but the big advantage they had was that they were very powerful. Uh, as earlier speakers have noted, uh, you know, you needed less officers, less trained officers to run something this big. Uh, that only works when you're talking about high-ranking officers because a regiment's a regiment. It needs a certain number of officers and lieutenants and captains. It, it doesn't matter, you know, how many men are in a division. You just need fewer brigadier and major generals if you have fewer divisions because they're very, very large. The big advantage to this division is that it can sustain enormous casualties and keep fighting. And, and this was a deliberate decision on the part of the United States Army. A French division uh, was about 14,000 men. A British division, something similar in size. Now that's, of course, at full strength. And by 1918, very few divisions on either side are at full strength. Uh, and it turns out the American divisions, when they go in, won't be at full strength either. Uh, but the concept was, we're making a steamroller. And it's going to be able to use just pure brute force attrition. To, to not, so when you shoot up half this division, there's still half left. You would have wiped out another division in another army, and we've essentially got a second division ready to roll right in. That The theory, the theory never quite works on the battlefield the way it's supposed to, uh, but that was the idea. Uh, the first commander of the division was Major General Edwin St. John Greville. Uh, 
Uh, he was a competent guy. Uh, he had been born uh, before the war between the states began, uh, but he had a long and distinguished career. But of course, there was no officer in the entire United States military who had ever been in a war like this. Even our own war between the states was, uh, in terms of technology and scale and bloodshed, uh, a pale shadow to what's been going on in Europe uh, since 1914. But General Grebel is going to turn out to be an excellent teacher. He does a very good job training the division. And the division was trained according to the dictates of General Pershing, who became the commander of the American Expeditionary Force. Um, and so the British and the French, as pointed out earlier, simply wanted our manpower. And we didn't want to do it that way. Uh, when, when we get into the war, we first believe that, you know, we're, we're going to send a token land force over there. Uh, our major contribution will be naval because it's really the U-boats that have made us so mad that we've got to fight this thing. Uh, and after all, the British and the French pretty much have it won because that's what their propaganda had been saying. And then when we get in and they send their liaison officers over here, we find out, oh, no, you're not about to win. You're about to lose and lose very badly. And the British and the French were very honest. It's like what we need is men. We need your men. And we wanted to send over an American army for political and patriotic and, and, and very good military reasons. Uh, but it would take time not to mobilize the manpower. That's fairly straightforward. But to equip these divisions with American trucks and American artillery pieces and American machine guns and, uh, you know, the, the, the whole logistical thing was going to have to be built from the ground up. And what the British and the French said was basically this. If you'll bring the troops over, we'll supply all that stuff. We'll, we'll, we'll use our ships to bring you over. We'll supply the trucks and the artillery pieces and all that kind of stuff. Just get your men over there. And so that was the deal that was made. Uh, and it fit the emergency. It allowed the American troops to get there in the nick of time in the summer of 1918 to save Paris and save the war uh, for the Allies. But the American army is going to suffer for that for another you know, six, seven months. Uh, because when you're borrowing somebody else's stuff and you're relying on their logistical uh, support and that kind of stuff, and, and, and there's a language barrier, it just doesn't work smoothly. Another problem was that the British and the French had been fighting in the trenches since the end of 1914, and they had a lot of experience on how to fight in the trenches and how to fight in no man's land. And it was hard one experience, and they sent... NCOs and officers over here to teach the Americans, well, this is the way you do it. And the Americans looked at that and they said, and this is why you've taken millions of casualties and gained five miles over the last three years. And so we don't really think that that is the way you do it. And Pershing was horrified by trench warfare. And to be honest, most military men everywhere were. Nobody expected trench warfare in World War I. Uh, it happened because there had been an industrial revolution that enabled you to put millions of men in uniform and keep them there and give them barbed wire and machine guns and poison gas and artillery uh, so that you can have a 500-mile unbroken trench line from the North Sea to the Swiss border. Nobody had prepared for that. And no matter what they tried, technology or strategy, it didn't break the trench stalemate. Uh, but from an American perspective, what the Europeans had been doing was crazy. And they had backed themselves up into a defensive mentality that was never going to achieve a breakthrough. So Pershing said, we're not going to train for that because that's not the way we're going to fight. We are going to train for offensive warfare. We are going to train to get beyond the trenches, to maneuver in the open field and defeat the enemy in that way. And so whereas the Europeans would say, oh, you've got to rely on grenades and mortars and all these sorts of things, uh, Pershing said, you know what's the most lethal weapon on the battlefield? An American marksman with his 1903 rifle. And everything's going to get built around him. So the emphasis was not on trench warfare, but on open warfare. The 36th train for a year at Camp Bowie outside of Fort Worth before it went overseas. Uh, there uh, is sometimes confusion because there's a Camp Bowie in World War II. The World War II Camp Bowie is outside Brownwood, Texas. Uh, 
Uh, both of these camps were built from scratch at the outbreak of the war. Uh, the Camp Bowie near Fort Worth uh, no, is, is paved over. <laughs> it no longer exists. Uh, but um, uh, the, the initial nickname of the division comes from uh, that Camp Bowie because there was an old story that there was a panther that used to roam around um, Fort Worth, and so they called it the Panther Division. Uh, it's not going to be the Panther Division by the time the war's over, but the, it's the Panther Division as they go overseas. Uh, the, it takes a month, basically, to get the division overseas, uh, and when it goes overseas, it gets a new commander because General Grebel was too old. He couldn't pass the physical, so Major General William R. Smith uh, got the job. He wasn't an infantry officer. He's a coast artillery officer and an expert on torpedoes. Not necessarily the kind of guy you would think you want in command of an infantry division, uh, but that was the situation of the Army. If like, you were a regular, you were going to get plugged into a spot like this, and it turned out that Smith is going to be an outstanding division commander. He knows his stuff, and his troops are going to think a great deal of him. Uh, once they get to France, they're sent uh, to a training area behind the lines about 80 miles away from Paris, uh, and uh, the artillery brigade is sent to a different training area. Of course, artillery was a very complicated, uh, is a complicated thing. Uh, and uh, so the artillery brigade gets detached from the division, and the war is going to be over before it comes back. So the artillery brigade is going to see no combat whatsoever. Uh, you gave new weapons to the troops, things like these 37 millimeter guns there on the lower right, and rifle grenades, <clears throat> and to prepare them. Uh, but it's going to be a very short training period because in the summer uh, and uh, in the late fall, uh, I'm sorry, the early fall of 1918, the Allies launch a massive offensive across the entire front. Uh, by this point, the American troops have proven themselves uh, sufficiently that they're given their own sector of the front. Uh, they've enjoyed a, a very dramatic success in reducing the St. Mikhail salient uh, in middle uh, part of September of 1918. And at the end of September, they're going to launch themselves into the largest, longest, bloodiest American offensive of the war, and that is the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, which begins on September 26th of 1918. So the day that offensive begins, the 36 is removed from its training camp and it is sent to the front. But it is not sent to the United States First Army, which is the army that's launching the Meuse Argonne. It is instead assigned uh, to the General Armies of the Reserve, uh, which was run by the French. And so this was sort of like the holding tank uh, for units that could be sent then wherever they were needed to go. Uh, and the French Fourth Army, which was operating to the immediate left of the American First Army in the Meuse-Argonne, uh, got the job uh, of protecting the American left flank and it asked for American troops. It wanted big American divisions and as the French general said, we want enthusiastic, young, aggressive-minded Americans, because the French armies were worn down. They really didn't have much offensive capability anymore, so obviously you wanted American troops. And so the second infantry division, which contained a brigade of U.S. Army soldiers and a brigade of U.S. Marines, uh, was assigned to the French Fourth Army, as was the 36th Division. Uh, and in early October of 1918, they went to the front. Uh, this is a picture that gives you some idea of the congestion on the roads, the conditions, the, the complexity of moving uh, a division into the front lines. Of course, there's stuff wounded and, and whatnot coming to the rear as you're trying to shove all these troops uh, up to the front. Uh, and the one thing uh, that uh, veterans of the war observed is that green troops marching toward the front sang when they were going in. Nobody sang when they were coming out. And the second time you went in, you didn't sing then either because you knew what you were going into. And of course, the troops understood that they were about to go into battle, uh, but they were about to go into battle in very, very bad conditions. The uh, French uh, had spent years trying to take uh, something called Mont Blanc, which is a huge ridge overlooking the Champagne region of France, and every French offensive had failed. If the French were going to stay apace with the American First Army as it dove into the Meuse Argonne, that ridge was going to have to be taken. And they gave the job to the 2nd Infantry Division, uh, 
which in several days of incredibly brutal close quarters combat managed to seize this ridge that had defied the French for three years uh, at a cost, of course, of extremely high casualties. Uh, and the 36th was brought in to relieve the front, uh, the, to relieve the second division, and to carry the attack past the ridge uh, into the town uh, of Saint Etienne. Uh, and this was uh, a situation uh, where the 36th was coming into action. It was a green division, never been under fire. The way that General Pershing did it in the American Army is he brought a division into the line in a pseudo quiet sector uh, for a couple of days, maybe a couple of weeks. You got it blooded, you got them in used to being shot at and shooting at people before you asked them to really do anything uh, that was going to be complicated. Uh, the 36th does not get that luxury. We're working on the French. Uh, and so uh, the French basically take the American this Green American Division, and they throw it into uh, the fighting, uh, not as one mass, uh, but as a uh, brigade at a time. And so the 72nd Brigade, I'm sorry, the 71st Brigade has to go in and relieve the, the Marines of the 2nd Division uh, on Mont Blanc, uh, and then they have to move that same night into attack positions against St. Etienne. Uh, the guides that are given to them to lead them to the front get lost. They don't know where they're going. Uh, and so the division spends the whole night moving around under machine gun and artillery fire. Uh, and uh, by the time they get themselves into position, uh, it's about 4.30 in the morning uh, of October 8th. And then the orders finally get to their commanders that at 5.15 you are jumping off into the teeth of the German defenses. There will be an artillery barrage that will advance in front of you, and you've got 30 minutes to get the order to your troops and send them forward. No time for reconnaissance, no time for coordination, no time to establish liaison. Uh, a lot of units don't get the order that they are about to attack until five minutes before they're supposed to jump off. And you can't delay it because the artillery barrage is going to go forward and you're supposed to advance 100 yards behind that artillery barrage, which is supposed to keep the enemy's head down so that you don't get slaughtered. Well, as you can imagine, that coordination broke down very, very quickly. Uh, the Germans knew this was coming. They were, in fact, withdrawing. Uh, having lost the ridge, they were backing up to the Inn River, uh, but they were fighting a uh, very determined rear guard action. Their artillery was in place. It dumped a deluge onto the American uh, troops of the 36th as they came out. Very quickly, there was a slaughter. Uh, officers, NCOs went down, coordination uh, between units broke apart, units themselves were shattered. Uh, the leadership uh, of this initial uh, brigade assault was basically decapitated from the very uh, beginning. There were supposed to be French tanks going forward, uh, but the French tanks were late or they didn't show up or they showed up and they didn't stay around very long. Uh, tanks were cantankerous things. They uh, were easily knocked out. They broke down. Uh, the French tankers had no real desire uh, to go forward into the teeth of the St. Anthean defenses, and so they backed out, and they left the infantry uh, all to itself. The German machine guns, though, were the worst of it. This MG-08 Maxim could fire 600 rounds per minute to an effective range of 2,000 yards, and the Germans had lots of machine guns. They had perfected machine gun tactics, uh, and these machine guns were often sheltered in concrete pillboxes. So there aren't trenches here to speak of. This isn't the psalm. This isn't over the top. This is a dress rehearsal for World War II with in-depth, defensive, concrete installations, interlocking fields of fire. These things are very hard to see and even harder to knock out. The enemy also had the advantage of the cover of woods. And so this is a rare thing. This is a combat photograph under fire of the 36th Division. The troops had to advance out into the open fields with the enemy in the trees to, on their flank and in their front. The units that were supposed to come up and support them on the flank uh, couldn't keep pace. Uh, you can always tell a real combat picture because notice the angle. The photographer is well to the rear, behind the troops, and very low. If you get a picture of brave men standing up and, you know, from their front or that, nobody's shooting at you at that point. 
uh, in, in these kinds of conditions, pinned down under fire, not just from the woods, but from St. Anthony in itself. From this church steeple, a German machine gun was bowling over American troops left and right and would continue to do so until an American artillery round, uh, we were uh, working with the 2nd Division artillery, uh, managed to uh, knock out the machine gun uh, in that church steeple. Uh, in conditions like this, it's every man for himself. The leaders are gone. Officers have no communication. There's no coordination. You are going to react uh, according to your training. And one of the things that would be remarked upon is the men of the 36 for being green had a lot of grit. Very few of them drifted to the rear. They pushed forward in ones and twos and threes. This is a 36th Infantry Division soldier uh, taking shelter behind a knocked out German pillbox. Notice he's using the Browning automatic rifle. Uh, which is invented in 1918. The 36 is one of the few divisions that got that weapon that will be very famous in World War II and Korea. Uh, but this is where American individualism, this is where the American spirit of get the job done, no matter what the hell's going wrong all around you, uh, really comes to the forefront. And this is circumstances where heroes are made. Men like Corporal Samuel M. Sampler, uh, who was born in Decatur, Texas. His platoon is almost wiped out. Uh, his guys are pinned down under machine gun fire. He takes a bunch of captured German grenades and he launches a one-man assault into that machine gun nest to knock out those guns and stop the fire on his men. And Corporal uh, uh, Harold Turner of Seminole, Oklahoma, he doesn't use grenades, he uses a bayonet and goes for charges machine guns at a distance of 25 yards and gets in there to bayonet the gunners and force those who weren't willing to be bayoneted to surrender so that his unit could continue to go forward. Both of these men are going to be awarded uh, the Medal of Honor for these kind of heroics and there were dozens and dozens of men who did the same thing, who didn't survive, who nobody saw do their acts of courage who enabled the division to keep pushing forward until you finally get to the moment that you're going to get to. For the German forces that are not going to retreat or surrender, it is hand-to-hand -hand combat. Personal, up close, whites of their eyes kind of stuff. Where you shoot men and you hear instantly what happens to their bodies when the lead strikes. Clubbed rifles, bayonets, trench knives, and trenching tools the real face of real war. And despite having been shelled, despite no support, despite the machine guns, the men of the 36 drove forward until they could knock out the enemy units uh, that refused to yield ground. And it was a bloody experience. In those first two days of the battle, the 71st Brigade suffered 1,600 casualties, 1,300 of them on the first day. But it was a big division, and those were big regiments. They could absorb the losses and keep going. This was a big shock uh, to the Germans uh, because they had never encountered American troops before. They didn't understand men who would keep coming regardless of casualties until they could close in and kill their enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat. After the capture of St. Etienne, the 36th Division is going to spend another 21 days in combat, and its learning curve is going to go up like a rocket. So it comes in completely green. It does a bunch of stuff wrong. Everything that can go wrong happens to it at St. at the end. As it pursues the Germans toward the end river, that changes. The division now operating you know, with you know, maps and knowledge and able to make its plans does an outstanding job and it also innovates. And one of the things that it innovates is the code talkers. Uh, the Germans were very good about tapping into uh, our field phone communication and that meant that you had to code messages before you sent them and they had to be decoded on the other end of the line and that was time consuming and there was all sorts of possibility for error and an unheralded officer in the 36 said, you know, we have a lot of Indians in the outfit. Let's get them and make them our communications people. And so they gathered up some Choctaw Indians who spoke in their own tongue to another Choctaw Indian on the other end of the line who spoke in his own tongue, and they could send the messages without coding them because the language was the code. And even when the Germans tapped in, they were like, what? What? <laughs> 
They didn't even know the Choctaw language existed, let alone uh, be able to decipher it. Uh, and the, the Marines get all the credit for the Navajo Code Talkers in World War II. The Marines are Johnny Come Latelys in this regard. The Texas National Guard's the one that figured this out. Uh, and if the war had gone on longer, the use of Code Talkers would have turned out to be much, much more important. This is a map that shows you the route of the division. Uh, so this pink part down here, that's the uh, fight uh, from Mont Blanc and St. Etienne, and then the green part is the advance of the division to the Inn River in pursuit of the Germans. And then you've got this one little green speck over here. That's where the 72nd Brigade is sent on October 26 to wipe out a German bridgehead uh, on the south side of the river. And this, uh, for a division that had only been in action for 20 days, uh, is an example of how quickly the Texans and Oklahomans learned because it is a textbook operation. Uh, maximum security and secrecy, surprise. Uh, the Germans had no idea it was coming. Uh, all the troops were briefed. Every man knew what he was supposed to do. They even went so far as when they were briefing the officers to say, okay, when this lieutenant gets killed, this is the lieutenant that takes over for him. <laughs> Encouraging way to go into a fight, right? Uh, but that's the kind of planning you have to do. And they overran this German position and took virtually no casualties doing it and wiped out that bridgehead. So in just 24 days of action, you went from sad sack, everything that can go wrong can go wrong, to a textbook style operation. The French were very impressed, as the French should be when they're dealing with Texans and Oklahomans. <laughs> and the commander of the French Corps, under which the 36 operated, said these very nice words about the division, recognized that they went into uh, into combat for the first time under extraordinarily difficult circumstances, and despite that, they did the job that they were asked to do. 24 days in combat, 30 distinguished service crosses, two medals of honor, and 128 French croix de guerre, or crosses of war. That's General Pershing decorating a soldier in the 36th Division. But it comes at a cost. In 24 days of combat, 800 dead, 74 mortally wounded, 674 wounded, and at least 177 gassed. It's a weird thing, but in World War I, gas was not considered wounded. You didn't get a Purple Heart if you were gassed. Uh, a lot of men were gassed, but not badly enough to send them to the hospitals, and so the, the number of gassed here would be far, far uh, larger than what's represented there. And that picture, of course, is the Meuse-Argonne National Cemetery, where a lot of those 800 men of the 36 still reside in the soil of France. By the time the war was over, 2,600 men and the 36th Division would have been killed, wounded, died of disease or in accidents and that sort of thing. Uh, total Texas deaths in the war, uh, almost 6,000, of whom 4,300 died overseas. Uh, compared to the losses suffered by other divisions, suffered by other armies in the war, these are relatively light, and it tells you something about the scale of World War I uh, that to say, oh, well, 6,000 dead, that's that nothing, that, that hardly counts uh, in, the, in the big picture of the war. Uh, but the division had done what it was asked to do. It helped occupy Germany uh, and came home in 1919 to a wonderful homecoming parade. Uh, one last little detail, uh, by the end of the war it wasn't uh, the uh, Panther Division, it was now the Arrowhead Division. Uh, during the Civil War, the Union Army had employed cat badges uh, to identify corps and division. And for some reason that went away after the Civil War. Uh, and as we really got into World War I, the idea came back, well, you know, we should revive that and give each division its own distinctive insignia and its own distinctive patch. Uh, only one division gets that done before the fighting is over, and that's the 1st Infantry Division. And so it wears a shoulder patch for like the last couple of weeks of the war. No other division during the war wears a shoulder patch. Uh, the 36th Infantry Division shoulder patch, which you see here, one of the original versions of it, uh, was approved by the War Department on November 11th, 1918. So the day the war ended. So if you see a uniform that's got a shoulder patch on it from World War I, it was put on after the war. Wasn't more in combat with that 
uh, shoulder patch. And the symbolism, the blue arrowhead for Oklahoma, which had been the Indian Territory before statehood, with the T for Texas superimposed on top of it. Of course, the T imposed on the arrowhead, uh, as it should be. Uh, and, uh, and so the 36th Division uh, you know, uh, did not see a lot of combat. It had really one big battle and one small battle. But in that period of time, it proved the value of the National Guard. It certainly proved the valor and the perseverance, the grit of the young men from Texas and Oklahoma and the other states in the Union who carried the rifles and manned the machine guns of that division. Uh, and that, uh, that story of heroism and valor, of course, would uh, be part of the esprit de corps of the 36th Division uh, when it goes into World War II. Uh, yeah, that war, of course, is the one that everybody really remembers. Uh, it overshadows this war. Uh, and for the 36, 444 days on the front line in combat in World War II versus 24 in World War I, uh, but the men who fought those 24 days uh, are heroes in every sense of the word, just like the men who fought those 444 days in the war that comes after the war to end all wars. Thank you. Uh, we could probably take maybe two questions for Jeff. He's ready. Jeff, that last photo you showed of the parade, was that Austin or elsewhere? Fort Worth. So they, they came back to Camp Bowie, and they got a big parade in, in Fort Worth. Yeah. One more, one more, one more. Or lunch. Okay, one more. Uh, to what extent was the flu epidemic affecting operations on the Western Front at this time? Pretty seriously, and it's interesting to note that the pandemic, the Spanish influenza, really only lasts for about six months in its most virulent form. Of course, it hits different parts of the globe at different times. Um, and it, nasty stuff, it, interesting, it tended to kill people of military age. Uh, and uh, for those of you who, who don't know a lot about it, it was essentially uh, caused an allergic reaction in its victims. And in its most serious forms, it caused hemorrhaging in the lungs. And so you, you could bleed to death in your own, or, or you could, uh, your own blood suffocated you. And it could happen in a very short period of time. There were lots of men who died of it in, in the camps. Uh, and uh, the extent to which it affects operations is that it's, it's a weakening of the forces by everybody. So when the division goes into action, it's saying it's going to get about 16,000 troops. Uh, so it's almost at half strength. And to some extent, that's sickness. Uh, and detachments and, and these sorts of things. Uh, one of the things that uh, military historians acknowledge is that there are all kinds of men who died uh, of wounds that they would have otherwise survived uh, because of the influenza. Uh, men who we think died of gas that actually probably died of the influenza and lots of guys who died up on the front lines who are listed as killed in action but who died of the influenza. Uh, and so there's, there's you know, no real way of knowing, but it was certainly an impact in the six month height of the influence. It kills more people worldwide than World War I does over its entire duration. Uh, and I've always thought that that was God looking down on humanity and saying, oh, you think you got this killing thing down? Let me show you how you really do it. Yeah. We're gonna have to wrap it up, folks. Uh, lunch is in the cafeteria, it is barbecue, and you will be at one o'clock in this room called the Big Tex or the one next to it, Little Tex. Pick up your poster while they are free. They will go on sale starting Monday. So we'll see you back in here or the other room at one o'clock. Thank you, Jeff.